Space Launch System is the next newest, biggest rocket that we're going to build. And it's not just a replacement for the Space Shuttle. This rocket is going to carry us much further than the shuttle would go. It's NASA's next big rocket for um, deep space exploration. The SLS is a national capability that provides um, a unique access to space that America has not had in 40 years. A large launch vehicle like this um, really opens the door to destinations beyond. It's not limited by destination. It's only limited really by imagination. What we're focused on here at this center is the propulsion system. And uh, that consists of two solid rocket boosters and a core with some tanks that feed uh, some liquid rocket engines in the middle. And then the astronauts sit on the top in the Orion um, uh, spacecraft. One of the things we recognized for SLS is we had to be affordable. So we had to do things differently, more efficiently, and smarter. We're all conscious about saving money, doing it uh, more affordable than we have in the past. But at the same time, we can't sacrifice reliability or safety. The system uses a um, significant amount of heritage hardware, which is things that we've evolved from the Space Shuttle program. The Space Shuttle had two kind of candle-looking things, which are the solid rockets. Those are kept, and those are used on SLS. We've added a segment uh, to the four-segment solid rocket boosters that we had on shuttle. That gives it more power, more thrust, and it helps this larger rocket get off the ground. What those boosters are for is just to get you going. They burn for a couple of minutes, and then they fall to the ground. Then your liquid engines, you're up high enough, your liquid engines can carry your vehicle to as high as you want to go, and if you have additional stages, like we're going to have one, then you can go further out into space. Right now, the inventory that we've got uh, consists of 14 engines that have flown on shuttle. We've got one engine that was assembled and still needs green run testing or certification testing. We looked at all the spares. As we collected the spares, we determined that we could assemble a 16th engine. So we'll have 16 engines that we'll be able to use for flight. We are making tremendous progress. We've got all of our prime contractors on board. Um, we're testing engines, we're testing solid rocket boosters, our avionics systems. J2X has set, uh, recently set a record at Stennis. Uh, when we were testing, it was the first liquid oxygen engine to get to a full duration test in four tests. We were developing this booster under the Ares program, and, and we're moving that into the SLS vehicle. The motor itself has been through three development firings, which are full-scale motors tested out in Utah, um, um, and we've gotten a lot of good data, engineering data, from those tests. This is an adapter that goes between the bottom of the Ryan capsule and the top of the Space Launch System rocket that we're developing here at Marshall. It's been specifically designed to give strength to the adapter so that it can take the loads in flight and still be lightweight. This shape started out as a series of flat panels. Um, the isogrid pattern was machined into the surfaces. Then they were formed, it was called bump, in a process called bump forming, to make them into the shape that we need here. And we weld three of these segments together to form the cone that you see behind me. We just, um, you know, delivered the first crew module uh, to the ONC building at KSE. We started a lot of the uh, parts onto the outside of the uh, CM, and we've actually put it in what we call the bird cage, so we can locate all those parts, you know, within you know thousands of an inch to make sure that uh, everything is going together okay. Putting you know wiring inside of it, putting tubes for the you know for the propulsion system, putting valves and pumps, and so all of that happens in stages right there uh, in the ONC building. We have uh, on contract with USA United Space Line to build uh, our harnesses. They're set up shop in the ONC, and so their little shop delivers to to the big shop. 
Thermal protection is very difficult in, in re-entry vehicles to, to test and to model. I mean, really, you have, to, you have to fly it to really understand what's going to happen. We're building ceramic thermal insulation tiles for the back shell of the capsule. Uh, we're building thermal barriers for the capsule, and we're building multi-layer insulation for that capsule. I'm the heat shield design lead. Uh, so we're designing and building the heat shield for the future Orion missions. The heat shield right now is in uh, our big 20 by 20 router. It's a five axis router. And uh, right now it's machining uh, the interior bowl, if you will, of the heat shield. To cut out that heat shield on the, on the router, it could take weeks of machine time uh, running multiple shifts. It's the biggest heat shield uh, ever constructed. The other component is the heat shield skeleton, so that's the piece of the titanium substructure, the backbone that makes up the, the carrier structure itself. Another unique thing is all the hand drilling that we're doing. So it's not automated by a router in this case, and it all has to be, be hand, hand drilled by technicians on the inside. 200 plus titanium parts all match drilled together. So we have a uh, tool that puts all the pieces in the right spot and then we drill and high lock them all together. MCC is transforming from uh, supporting space shuttle and space station to a platform that will support space station and MPCB or Orion. In order to adapt for the future, we need to go to a more modern system. KSC will, still, will operate the vehicle all the way up until launch. We'll operate the vehicle until splashdown and the recovery forces come in and take over after that. Firing Room 1 is the launch control room we're going to use for Orion SLS for EM-1 missions. We've been working with the Orion program to get the spacecraft data so we can, we can process it with our software in the firing room and we will be flight following that mission out of Firing Room 1. We refitted the room, we redid it, putting the sound suppression carpeting on the walls, making it kind of a more comfortable place to work. So we're aiming for about 50 people in Fire Room 1 for an EM-1 mission. We are actually using Fire Room 1 right now to test Pad B uh, subsystems. This pad is going to be a, almost like a complete new pad because we will have refurbished each and every system that it's inside the pad. We're going to have the vehicle uh, launch from the mobile launcher, and not only launch from the mobile launcher, but have a tower that, that will have all the services attached to the vehicle. The tower is going to be on the mobile launcher. The vehicle will be assembled at the VAB. It's a return to a concept that we knew that worked very well during the Apollo years when the mobile launch platform had a tower on it. We knew that the VAB was designed to accommodate a launch tower on a mobile launch platform. We have to make sure that the, v the VAB can remain adaptable and accommodate different vehicle architectures. And now we have a clean VAB uh, shell, per se, the, the infrastructure, so that we can accommodate the, the new hardware, the new vehicle access with uh, new platforms. And that is the first phase that we're doing now. And once the vehicle is ready with all the connections, the only thing we gotta do is move the vehicle to the pad, do the connections to the mobile launcher. And once we do those connections, we're ready to launch. There was a time where I had to explain what a crawler was. Um, if you didn't work out here at the Space Center or if you weren't in the Central Florida area, a lot of people just, uh, you know, somehow the, the vehicle got out to the pad. We knew what to expect from a, a load perspective with the new vehicle, the larger rocket and things along those lines. And that goes from the crawler lifted load, the hydraulics, also to the crawler way. Um, we're going to have to increase uh, the load capability for the crawler way itself uh, with the rock. What we've essentially done is keep all the same hydraulic components but just in, uh, increase the size and the diameter of the hydraulic cylinders. Last November, we actually took a, took a ride out with the completed Crawler 2 out to the pad and tested out the systems and a couple punchless items, but everything worked great. 
the control system had been upgraded, the, uh, the, cabs con the driver's cab consoles had all been replaced, the brakes had all been replaced. Uh, nearly every subsystem had some kind of work done to it. The traction support elements, uh, each of the, the four corners has 22 rollers that are about the size of a car, to be honest with you, and uh, we're changing out all of those and enlarging those as well. What I love doing is reminding the outside world, whether it's within our government or especially the media, that has a perception that we're in a lull, there's nothing going on, that, that you know the space program's shutting down, to kind of dispel that rumor and say, no, we're, we're, this is the, the far opposite for us. We are utilizing this inter-programmed time frame to make all the modifications and all the infrastructure changes that it will help bring that agency vision into reality. Many of us feel the country wants to go forward, and, and, and NASA has a big following, and every time I talk to people, they're excited about NASA. Enabling people to go beyond where they have ever gone before and look and discover things that they didn't even know existed is just, it's just a real honor. It's been a pleasure to be involved with this project, and I can't say enough for the team that's put this together. I'm privileged to work this program. I think most people who are working it today feel the same way. I can't believe they pay me for this job. It's just wonderful. It's great.